of a black aesthetic is also this idea of, of self-determination. And so it's like, how do you marry those two things and marry those two things in, an, in, in a structure and in an environment where you're, you're not undermining the aesthetic value of the work while you're at the same time trying to advance an idea about a, a certain kind of cultural determinism. So how do you do those two things simultaneously? So that's obviously being black, uh, you know, black owned, we, you hear it all the time. You know, black people need to own their own businesses, you know? Or you need to buy stuff, for, buy black, you shop at black businesses. I mean, this, these, things, these are themes and, and, and recurring ideas that are, that are cyclical. They keep coming back, and they keep coming back at periods in which uh, trauma and tragedy uh, seem to be at a heightened uh, level. Of, of, we seem to be hyper aware. I, I had a show at the, the Secessions, Vienna Secessions, and that show was called Who's Afraid of Red, Black, and Green? Mm -hmm. <laughs> which was based in part on a Barnett Newman painting, if you know in our history, Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue? And so and I did three paintings. Uh, well, I'm skipping around here. <laughs> this was from the, from the, the uh, uh, Meditation on Black Aesthetics show at the MCA. And so it's the way in which you sort of, you can take, you can take uh, cultural, ideas that are culturally specific and culturally re relevant, and you can put them in a formal configuration that sort of explores two different dynamics simultaneously. In the same way that the, that black figure in the portrait of the artist as a shadow of his former self was also about a kind of simultaneity. Can you have presence and absence simultaneously <laughs> and have those both embodied in a single image? But as I was saying about that, who's afraid of red, uh, black, and green, and the Barnett Newman, who's afraid of red, yellow, and blue? This painting, which is in the show at, at uh, LA MOCA, is one of us, uh, uh, it's like a triptych. And so and what I did with the Barnett Newman painting, so Barnett Newman's painting was who's afraid of red, yellow, and blue. And on each end of the, he had a, a big color field painting, and on each end of it, there was, a, uh, there was a red painting with a blue stripe and a yellow stripe, and those stripes he called zips. And so, but I, and, and, and the, the effect of color field painting was supposed to create this space in which you can have an experience that's like transcendence. Um, but I said, well, is, is there a way of having that same kind of experience with the expanse of color in a field like that, but not have that experience point towards transcendence, but have it reflect back again on the kind of political and cultural history. And so there's a, this is a text painting that's writing in that red field. It's red on red. Uh, it's hard to see here, but it's easier to see at the museum. But the text in the painting says, if they come in the morning. And so if, if for anybody who's, oops, good thing that wasn't open. <laughs> for anybody who's uh, studied their political science, you know, the Angela Davis published a uh, collection of letters from political prisoners in the United States. And the title of that book she published was If They Come in the Morning. Mm -hmm. But she took the title from an open letter that Jane Baldwin wrote to her when she was in jail after she had been uh, finally arrested when she was on the, on the run from the FBI. And he wrote a letter to her, an open letter to her, with the quote at the end of it saying, if they came for you last night, my sister, I'm sure they'll be coming for me in the morning. Um, but so what I did was I took the Barnett Newman painting, and I, I made, since my theme was red, black, and green, I made three paintings, and these paintings are exactly the same size as the Barnett Newman painting. Uh, but each one of my paintings privileges a different color as the primary color in the field. And so if this is the red one, and then this is the black one, and each one of them did different things. And then this was the green one. So these are all at the nine feet, eight feet by 18 feet. So, and so, but it's the way in which you can kind of, you can do, you, you can always do two things at once, which is what I'm always trying to do. 
is that uh, to at once be socially engaged, politically engaged, culturally engaged, but to also be aesthetically engaged. Because after all, when you're making a painting, you're making a painting. <laughs> and the painting has to work as paintings do, regardless of what's in the painting. So that's so. This is a, this is one way of, of dealing with history. So this is dealing with art history and with cultural history. And so this is also dealing with with ideas about abstraction and representation as well. So this is obviously a tree with some leaves and some birds, and then there's some buildings. Uh, the buildings in the back behind the tree, a black one and a red one, so you got a red, black, and a green. Those function in the same way the zips would function in the Barney Newman painting. But you can have them do those kinds of things, but you can have them also refer to or represent other things. So this is actually a kind of a, uh, um, it's a kind of a representation of James Baldwin's book, The Fire Next Time. I always considered myself a history painter. Uh, in, in, in the broadest sense of the terms, you know, in, 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 in the way we understand art history, history painting was the more privileged discipline in, the history, in, in, in the way we think about art. <clears throat> because it was the thing that required the most intellectual investment and the highest degree of skill in order to realize uh, adequately. So this is what everybody who was going to the academy, who was studying, you know, and looking at Leonardo, looking at Michelangelo, looking at, this is what they wanted to do. They wanted to be able to demonstrate their intellectual capacity, their organizational skills, their compositional skills, their, head, their, their way of managing figures, all those things, all of that stuff was supposed to be able to come together in these things called history paintings. Uh, portrait painting was one of the lowest levels of performance that artists could be invested in. They only did, and they did, but that was the only way they could really make money. It's like artists only really made their living really by doing portraits, um, especially after the period in which the church was the primary uh, patron for what artists did. Um, and so artists, so those salons in Europe were an opportunity for artists to do these giant history paintings to demonstrate what they could do so that people get excited about those works. That work would be bought by either the king or by the state. And then the people who couldn't buy that work, you know, the barons and the duchess and people like that, they would get their portrait painted by that artist because he was the hot artist of the moment. That's how it worked. But I do uh, portraits that are about historical figures who have a, a meaningful uh, presence in American history, but for whom there are no images that represent them. And so these next four pictures are part of a, a group called the Stono Group. And we know one of the earliest slave rebellions in the United States in the 18th century, this is before the 19th century, but in the 18th century, was a rebellion in, Car in uh, North Carolina near the Stono River by a group of slaves who, had, who very nearly managed to get to St. Augustine, Florida, where the Spanish had promised that anybody who could escape to St. Augustine would be made free. So they were on their way, but they made a fatal mistake. A fatal mistake, because they had started out, they were cutting heads for, on their way. <laughs> And they stopped. They, 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 they were feeling too good about themselves. They stopped and started having a party, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and that gave people in the, in the town enough time to reorganize, regroup, and cut them off before they got across the river. And that was the end of that. And so all of the leaders, well, everybody was effectively killed and hung. But I made a, a group of portraits that were, the, the man who was the leader of the group was named Cato or Jimmy. And so all of these images are actually of the person who was the leader of, that, of the group. It was also, it was the Stonewall Rebellion, also known as Cato's Rebellion. 
And so I made some images of the, all these figures on, they, this is at, the, at dawn, with the breaking of dawn on the gallows. And you can see it, each one, it, it, variations of the name Cato, or Jimmy, or Jimmy Cato, with a K, or with a C, or with an I, or with a Y. I mean, it's, uh, this is just variations on it, but these are all re representatives of the Stono group, the Stono rep. And through the four paintings, you see it starts out at just at daybreak, and then the day brightens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but they also figures like this one, the painting of John Punch, who is another figure who, around whom the idea of black people as slaves for life was codified. Um, and so these are people who have a presence in history, but for whom there is no representation. And often it's a representation, it's an image of somebody that that is the catalyst for people looking further into the story to find out what it was about and who that person was. Uh, same in case with uh, this picture of David Walker. And I take into account the fact that there are no pictures of David Walker, so the painting is titled, Believed to be a Portrait of David Walker. <laughs> Circa. <laughs> you know, so you can, this is a way of talking about presence and absence at the same time as it is about presenting an image that refers to something that you don't have an image of. So it's, I mean, there are all these ways in which you can do things like that. Now, we have a lot of pictures of, well, actually, there, there's one, one real, one purported drawing that's supposed to be of Nat Turner. Uh, but I did a, this is a portrait, my painting on the left, Caravaggio on the, <laughs> my painting on the right, Caravaggio on the left. <laughs> Just in case you were confused. <laughs> but anyway, a portrait of Nat Turner with the head of his master. <laughs> um, but anyway, so let me just let me just show some stuff, <laughs> uh, so I can leave some. So now th that cartoon, those comic strips have sort of come back into play, um, and the show Mastery is based on the way in which I used the term master in my this comic strip I've been developing called Rhythm Master. Um, uh, but it also has the museum as a part of its origin as well. So that corridor where those Figures out that is the that used to be the African Art Corridor at the Art Institute in Chicago. That's where it all starts, <laughs> and it's a way in which those figures that are in the vitrines become animated as a series of power figures and superhero characters that can then engage in a more extended kind of epic narrative story. And so that's how it started, and it, it started with this project in this form called dailies. And it's looking at the way in which you pick up, the, you used, used to be able to pick up a daily comic strip and not see a black cartoon character in there anywhere. <laughs> it's still pretty much like that. <laughs> but getting a little bit, a little bit better. But so I've developed this whole epic story that I won't go into. Uh, but you, you get the idea. So, it's all, it's all about art, it's all about representation, it's all about forms, uh, but it's also about history and it's also about culture. <clears throat> so this is the ideal form of the daily. So it took its form from the, you take a, a full sheet of the Chicago Tribune and you look at the way the daily cartoon strips, all of the different formats that the daily cartoon strips come in, from a single panel frame to three or four panels in a strip, and then I use because they were, because all of my strips were, were black oriented strips, that space around them gave you a way of sort of playing with the relationship between those strips, and I can move those things around the page at will, uh, given what I was interested in as far as design was concerned. So and then I, I had a couple of friends of mine. So you can see that the translation in there is Chinese and that's Korean. Um, and I, and, and I think uh, Dutch. <laughs> but I started to add to the conversation, I started to have them translated into all these different languages and then simply add the translation to the strip. So it's the same phrase, but in all these different languages. And then you can sort of look at how there's certain kinds of idioms that don't translate directly, 
but how you can keep, get the sense of an idea in a different language, and then how those things miss each other sometimes because the translations don't, don't quite go uh, together accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I did that, so that comic strip, I did a project at the Wexner Center in Ohio once, and I, I did that uh, project as a Bunraku puppet show. So I made these puppets based on those characters, and I had 20 high school kids from the Columbus, Ohio area who uh, we taught how to, how to do it. And they did the narration, they did the puppets, they performed the puppets. My wife directed the show. I made the puppets, wrote the script, and Cahill of the bar uh, did the music. That was, and you see the, those figures, that Sanufo figure, that was the, the girl who was the protagonist. Stacia was named after my niece. <laughs> anyway, listen, I'm going fast now. <laughs> See, I do a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff. Okay, so here's just like painting and animation. So this is a suite of five paintings. And the point of it is so they do that. Dance. It won't go back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so art has to come on. So can you do aesthetics and come modification at the same time? <laughs> you know, why pay more for one thing as opposed to another thing? Because it has some, in, does it have some intrinsic value that you are uh, uh, acknowledging by paying more? Or is, so what if, uh, is that low, low price? Each one of them were about me. And then I did, so that's the show that those were in, along with those coins. And that, those coins are part of a thing called the 99 cent piece. <laughs> it's 99 cents in change. <laughs> but with the, that quarter, it's five feet in diameter. And they're gilded. So it's three quarters a dime, two nickels, and four pennies. <laughs> and it's done like a scatter sculpture. All right, big print, paintings, paintings, paintings. <laughs> oh, we're running out of time. Uh, uh, the color of these photographs, so, it, it, so what these sort of point to is that in, in the work, it's like I explained earlier, the work that I do is always about the nature of being the thing that it is at the same time that it's about the subject matter that's in it. So and if you ask the question about what makes a photograph a photograph, what determines the quality of a photograph, and one of the things that light is what determines the quality of a photograph. And in the same way that in that first picture, in the portrait of the artist that shadows for myself, I was interested in visibility and invisibility. I'm also interested in visibility and invisibility when it comes to photography, too. And so the condition of the photograph is determined by the kind of light that you use to render it. And so these are photographs, the Black Christmas, the Black artists in the studio, these are all photographs that are shot under ultraviolet light, which is also known as black, black light. <laughs> and so what kind of photograph do you get when you photograph under black light? What kind of photograph do you get when you photograph under white light? You get different kinds of photographs. <laughs> so that's as much the subject of the photograph as the subject matter. What can you, can you do photographs in the dark? I mean, can, effectively, when you use black light, you're photographing at the, at the invisible end of the spectrum. You're photographing in the dark. And can you create beauty when you're photographing in the dark? I mean, these are questions that the work is built around. Um, and I think this is, this is the last thing. So this is, this is a photo, this photograph, the title of the photograph is Black. And so it's, if, you, if you've ever been to Chicago, Michigan Avenue is right, uh, runs along Grant Park. Lakeshore Drive is on the eastern side of Michigan Avenue. So this is a photograph of the Johnson's Publishing Building, where they published Ebony and Jet Magazine, mm. taken from Lakeshore Drive at night so that you get the Ebony and Jet sign, which are two extreme representations of black. In a photograph that is essentially black. Yeah. 
So it's it's the way in which the idea of the thing sort of folds back in on itself. You know, it becomes kind of a loop where the, where you you create this this um, uh, condition that you could call embodiment. And embodiment is the way in which the thing that is represent the thing is what it purports to represent. So that, you should keep that in mind when you think of embodiment is that the thing is what it purports to represent. So if you say, I'm making a picture about black, it's got to be black and about black at the same time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, you get a sense. Now, we, now we, we're at the Q&A section of the, of the <laughs> talk. So you get a sense, this is how I think about what I do. This is why that's, and why is there so much variety in what I do? Because I also have this idea that if you, want to, if you want to have any say in how you participate in the larger art world that you might be going to school to be a part of, then you have to put yourself in a position where there can't be people in the world who will claim to know more about what you're doing than you do. <laughs> so and if somebody says something to you about a thing, you have to say, I have something to say about that too. That you can never be in a position where you can't participate at the highest level at criticality or anything else. You can't be outside the conversation if you want to participate in the game. <laughs> you got to be in it to win it. <laughs> and you got to be playing for keeps. <laughs> because there's no halfway, there's no halfway to be a part of it. <laughs> Because halfway, <laughs> you know, I was, it's like halfway is a bench player on the Lakers who never gets in the game. <laughs> and he was only used as a trading token so they can get somebody else who can play better. <laughs> That's halfway. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm in it for the, I'm in it for everything that is worth. <laughs> Thank you.